Good evening, folks. This is The Weird Part, and I am your host, Vincent Trewell. This evening will be a solo episode, but this one may be shorter than when I have a guest. But I think you'll still find some things interesting, and I think we'll have a good time. Um, as it happens, and I won't use the term synchronicity because I don't think it rises to that level, but something interesting happened in the last few days. I finished reading after what should have been read a lot earlier, but I finished reading American Cosmic by Dana Pasolka, and fascinating book. And that same day that I finished reading her book, I began watching the Netflix documentary series, Rael, the Alien Prophet. And those seemed to fit together really nicely. Uh, both involve the subject of the creation of a UFO religion. And in fact, I could subtitle this episode, The Creation of a UFO Religion, Theory and Practice. A lot of what uh, Dr. Pasolka talks about in American Cosmic dovetails with what is shown in the docuseries. So, without exhaustively delving into either work, I would like to really touch on, upon their commonalities. And I think there's quite a bit there. So, let us begin. We'll start with um, American Cosmic um, by Diana Walsh Pasolka. Dr. Pasolka is a PhD in religious studies and is a professor of that subject at the University of North Carolina. American Cosmic came out in 2019, subtitled UFOs, Religion, Technology. And in it, Dr. Pasolka both presents theory of how UFO beliefs, particularly the very much nuts and bolts hypothesis and the extraterrestrial hypothesis that the UFO phenomena is primarily flesh and blood aliens question something, physical aliens coming in physical ships from a far off planet. That that is, she's not saying that's true. She is saying that that is the dominant view in pop culture in America and around much of the world. And that that is producing a belief system that is becoming a UFO religion. And she has a lot of very, very insightful things to say about that. And a real discussion of what religious beliefs mean, what, how a religion evolves to take over a culture and become the main religion, how people relate experiences they have to a religious context. She has a lot of really, really interesting things to say. There's also a storyline in which she interacts with some fascinating people and has some experiences. And I found some of that to have some issues. But we'll, we'll talk about that later. But she is a serious intellectual who is taking on the subject of UFO beliefs from a humanities perspective. And very valuable book, and I'm very glad that I read it. The Netflix docuseries, Royale, the Alien Prophet, has hit just about a week ago, and has been quite popular, and is absolutely fascinating. But I do have to give some warnings. Uh, and I'll just give the warnings, and then we'll move on from that. Um, 
there are numerous mentions of sexual assault, numerous mentions of pedophilia. I want to get those warnings out there. There's also, and this is, you know, my own two cents. There's a lot of nudity in here and it's not good. It's very much the 1970s, for lack of a better term, hippie nudism that in my humble opinion basically serves as a public service announcement for why people usually wear clothes. Some of this was hard to watch. Um, it's just bad. It's just, you know, I could have gotten the story without seeing all that. But um, it, it just, it wasn't good. But that doesn't detract from the story, which is absolutely fascinating. And is true. And is ongoing. And there's a lot to it. Um, at the same time, be advised, at some point, Rael, the guru, hands out uh, small mirrors so everybody can get a good look at their own anus. That really happens. It happens a couple times. It's multiple times. It's apparently it's a thing they do. So there you go. Uh, you have been warned. Um, so yes, um, absolutely fascinating series. Um, it's only four episodes. Those four episodes are about 45 minutes each. So you can easily binge watch it. I watched it in two, two episode chunks. And I really wish it had been longer. I wish it had been about double that length because there's tons of material. This sect has been going on for about 50 years. I believe it, right around, almost exactly 50 years. And it is a fascinating phenomenon um, in a social science sort of way. And you see a lot about cult behavior I'm not going to pull any punches. It's absolutely a cult. There's no, there, there's no, uh, you know, hesitation there. Uh, it's 100% a cult. It's not a good thing to be in. I would strongly urge anybody not to be involved with it in any way, shape, or form. Um, that's one of the things that was disturbing watching it is Royale who is a guy who was a race car driver in France and whose given name is Claude, I'm going to massacre the last name, but it's Vorhelan, V-O-R-I-L-H-O-N, Claude Vorhelan, um, who was born and raised in France, um, became a race car driver and a magazine writer about race car subjects and, you know, racing subjects and um, was apparently uh, pretty successful in that, that avenue. But um, when certain government restrictions cut into his ability to drive as fast as he wanted down the highways, shortly thereafter, he had a visitation from and I'm not making this up, a little green man who told him some things that led him to become a prophet and a messiah of the Raelians. So there you go. Um, I'll get more in detail in a little bit, but I just want to kind of break down in the most bare bones way these two works and how neatly they dovetail. Um, but yes, um, give me one moment here. I do want to mention the name of the director of Rael, the alien prophet, and that is Yoav, Y-O-A-V, Shamir, S-H-A-M-I-R. Um, he was born in Israel and he's directed other things and this was originally came out in, well, it was created in 2020, but Netflix has just released it now. Um, so yes, just wanted to kind of balance the two works with, you know, sufficient capability for people to look it up. But yes, um, 
disturbing but very very educational and you know interesting work there so yes um these two productions the book and the docu series seem to really fit together to me and that made me think that that Dr. Brasolka had several very interesting things to say about UFO phenomena and about the human mind and about human cultures. One was that, and these are my understanding of what she had to say. I welcome to being open to being corrected. Um, but this is what I took from her writing that while our conscious minds are able to delineate quite easily between fact and fiction, or at least, you know, films, videos that are purporting to be factual, and those that are purely fiction, that our subconscious mind does not make that distinction. That was fascinating to me. I, you know, I don't know all the data on that, but that makes a lot of sense. And that's something that I certainly stuck with me. Um, also, she pointed out that, and made quite the case, that people exp have experiences that are very raw, that are very hard to understand. And almost inevitably, they will filter them through their pre-existing beliefs or through what she called the book experience, where in looking to understand something unexplainable that has happened to you, a person will often come upon a book that seems to ring true and explain it all. And it doesn't have to be a book. It could be a movie. It could be a TV show. It could be a lot of things. And that that will then provide a context which wasn't present in the original experience. And to me, that made a lot of sense. Um, that now it all makes sense is a very common experience after having had a very 14 or just hard to interpret or hard to accept experience. Also, and really to me, the largest point that she makes in this book is that ideas form in a culture where even if you don't believe in the thing described, you know what they're talking about. You know exactly how it works. There's sort of a script that builds in a society, and it builds in ours through modern-day folklore, which includes, but not limited to, books, nonfiction and fiction, um, TV shows, fiction and nonfiction, film, fiction and nonfiction, memes, stories, things that you've heard almost imperceptibly give you a framework to interpret something that happens or something that's said to happen. And even if you completely do not in any way accept the reality of UFOs or of alien life of any kind, you still know exactly what to expect. There's a script that's in our society now, and you can laugh at it. You can not believe any of it. You can, like probably myself and most of my listeners, take a kind of, yes, I believe UFOs are real. I believe people have real, sometimes extremely intense experiences, but I don't think that aliens and alien, alien bodies, living aliens, are commuting to and from our planet in some sort of metal ship. I, I, don't, I don't think that that's the right explanation. But I certainly know exactly what they're talking about. Um, you know precisely, where, whatever you believe or don't believe, you know precisely what they're talking about. And we've, even if you avoid this type of thing, you can't really avoid it. It's in our culture now that the extraterrestrial hypothesis, the nuts and bolts UFO, and the 
non-human intelligence, walking, talking alien, who may or may not probe people and do experiments on them. That's all part of our pop culture now. And pop culture sounds a little too light and airy. It's a deep part of how we, in our modern-day American society, and many, many other places around the globe, it's a major part of how we perceive reality. And you can see that in things like the disclosure movement. Across the political spectrum, and it's rare when you can say that these days, but across the political spectrum, when people are talking about disclosure, they're usually talking about show us the ships, show us the dead aliens. And that everybody knows what we're talking about. Nobody like has to ask aliens from where? What do you mean ships? No, everybody gets it. Whether you've devoted 10 minutes of your life to looking into this stuff or not, it's part of the culture now. And she really illustrates how that works, how it's worked in past cultures, and how it's certainly working on us right now. And from that, the possibility emerges of a true UFO-based religion developing. I found that absolutely fascinating. The, and I'll just jump right into it right now. The drawbacks to the book American Cosmic, or at least, you know, I don't want to be harsh because it's, it is a, a brilliant work. I did have some difficulty with her own personal experiences not because I didn't think they were real, in the sense of, I don't believe that she told one word here that she didn't believe to be 100% true. However, we have, for those who listen to the show and those who are generally interested in the unexplained and, you know, keep aware of these type of things for a period of time, we've seen this happen to other people where things were staged to give them the experience of being in the know, of having experienced something amazing. And I felt throughout the book that she was being prepped and she was being prepared. And to be blunt, she was getting the Linda Moulton Howe treatment. And I mean, I'm going back a ways when I mentioned Linda Moulton Howe. Uh, she was a frequent guest on Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell in the late 90s. So, I mean, we're, we're going back a ways. But she was a award-winning journalist, a reporter, a highly competent reporter. And she was lured in by people, disinformation agents of the U.S. government, including the infamous Richard Doty who did the same thing to Paul Benowitz and promoted an entire subgenre of alien beliefs that were completely made up. And the stuff Linda Moulton Howe was given was completely made up and designed and was faked to send her off in the wrong direction, which it did. And she was reporting things that were told to her that were made to seem true with faked evidence. And they didn't go after Linda Moulton Howe because she was a poor journalist or she was gullible or something like that. No, they went after her. She's a really good journalist. It would be taken seriously. And yet they use that. When I say they, I mean, you can name the names if you do the cursory research. And Dodie was one of them. And there are a number of people involved in feeding her things that were lies so that they would get out into the culture and permeate it with false beliefs about cattle mutilation, about aliens doing all sorts of things that the people telling her this knew perfectly well was not happening. And Benowitz, the same thing happened to him. And there they went really high tech. And, I mean, Benowitz ended up in a long-term in a mental hospital 
because of things that Richard Doty and company, I don't want to make Doty more than he was. He was a cog in the machine, but his, his function as a cog in the machine was to spread disinformation. And he went above and beyond in doing that. And they were able to use high tech means to make Doty see things that he perceived as being alien that were not. Um, they gave him a special computer, which they then used to make him think that he was communicating with aliens when he was not. He was just communicating with disinformation agents. And they gave him the story of the underground Dulcie base and faked enough for him to completely believe that there was a deep multi-level underground military base. And that in there, and this didn't all come through Benowitz, um, but it came through a number of people because the disinformation was organized. And a lot of people came to believe that there's this base in Dulce, New Mexico, and that hundreds of feet under the ground, there are floors that are completely run by aliens. There are alien hybrids being produced. There are different species being combined using high tech genetic engineering that came from the aliens, that there was a full on shootout between special forces, military people and aliens but that all happened. And it's just, it's a wild story that was made up. It was concocted and fed to Benowitz and fed to others. And I couldn't help but think that perhaps a lot of Dr. Prasalka's experiences were manufactured to give her the impression that alien ships are a physical reality, that there are crash ships, that there are dead and possibly living physical aliens here in government custody or in corporate custody. And even more that it's almost like this was scripted around her to have her perceive exactly what they wanted her to perceive. And I won't give spoilers because it's a great book. It's not all that long and it's well worth your time. But I could never not have huge doubts that the experiences that she had weren't a well-managed presentation to get her to believe exactly what someone wanted her to believe and that it might all be disinformation. When she was talking about her subject, when she was talking academically, philosophically, she is spot on. I mean, her work is fantastic. She even has a, it's just a few paragraphs, but it, I think it's two or three pages, but it takes apart the whole phenomena of synchronicity. And it's kind of, it's her experience with synchronicity, but it's also very much a warning not to get too far into synchronicity. And I thought it was priceless. That was a really good episode there. Really good story. True story. But um, a lot of the things that she witnessed really seemed to me to be staged, to be set up. And even the people setting it up may not have known why they're setting it up this way. That is strongly the impression I got. It just, the vibe of a disinf disinformation op, psyop, came very strong to me in reading her work. So that was my impression. Again, um, a really brilliant work as far as the social science component goes. Um, but her own personal experiences, I'd be very careful with fully accepting her interpretation thereof. She has written another book, Encounters, which I've got to pick up, and perhaps we'll see where that goes from there. But those are my, my thoughts on American Cosmic, um, just that it was a lot of really good explanations of how religions develop, how people interpret anomalous experiences through the lens of their pre-existing religious beliefs, and how a culture comes to believe in certain things unintentionally, but very powerfully. 
and how the human mind isn't really the best at separating fact from fiction. And, and she really hits this note well, that in today's world, a whole lot of people don't really care. She really expounds on that and is very good. That a whole lot of people in our society do not care whether something's real or not. As a person who spent some time in the 14 community, and, you know, this is a big chunk of my life. And yes, I do care if something's real or not real. But millions of other people, that's not top priority. That's not even second priority. That's not even in the top 10. Most is this entertaining? And not much thought is given to, well, is this real? Did this actually happen? Or is this just a funny story? An interesting story, a scary story. But she really makes a lot of great points. And I just, you know, have issues with some of the real life experiences or allegedly real life experiences that she has, which I do not question in any way that she had that experience. I just feel that it was an experience, most likely, my interpretation, my impression, is that these may have been experiences that were Taylor made for her to reach a certain point in her believing things she's supposed to believe. I've digressed, but um, excellent book, and you should definitely get it. Um, so let's just turn to the other topic, which is the Netflix documentary series, Rael, the Alien Prophet. This was, as I said, there's some disturbing portions, but it had a lot of really interesting, really good things to say. And some of it was really, I'll be honest, there was kind of a, a sad tone to a lot of this because, and I'm going to digress for just a little bit, but one thing that is valuable that comes out of this is that you can see that there shouldn't be a stigma attached to being in a cult that anyone, and I mean that quite literally, anyone under the right set of circumstances can be drawn into a cult. And cults don't announce that, hey, we're a cult, we're going to take all your time, all your money, and basically wreck your life. No, it's always painted in a very attractive light. And they talk to a number of former members and some, well, they talk to people who are still with the cult and which has been around for about 50 years. And some people have devoted enormous chunks of their life to this and others devoted, you know, decades or more. And then realized that this was a huge mistake and went through some really difficult circumstances facing that fact. And what really strikes home is that a lot of the members were highly educated. These are sophisticated people. These are not in at least an economic or socioeconomic sense. These are not desperate people looking for anything. No, these are people who generally were successful in society and looking for something they couldn't find came upon this and it's really disturbing because it would be different if Rael was unusually good at being deceptive and bringing some absolutely fascinating new concept to the world of cult leaders but it wasn't as an outsider looking in you can just see this is just the usual cult leader crap. There's very little that's original at all. I mean, I'd have to say almost nothing in the Raelian religious movement is unique to them. Like, just nothing. And it's just painfully obvious as a viewer. These people are getting cleaned out of their money, their time. Um, in a lot of their relationships with their family and their often their marriage, often their relationship with their 
parents, the relationship with their children, just everything in their life is being cleaned out. And the guy doing it is not some genius level manipulator. It's just your common, I would say, garden variety cult leader that does what, if you listen to a hundred different podcasts or books or documentaries on cult leaders, it's the same crap over and over and over. And Real is no exception whatsoever. You see over and over, he just tells people this ridiculous story. And it's not even particularly creative. You could get all of the basic tenets of realianism from um, just paperback novels, popular at the time, any number of movies and TV shows. There's literally nothing original in there at all. Especially when one considers that Chariots of the Gods by Eric Van Daniken was probably at its height of popularity right around the time he founded this cult. So yeah, what he's basically saying is if you just weaponized Van Daniken's Chariots of the Gods beliefs and basically said, and the aliens met me, I, I'm the guy, I'm the messiah. I am the voice of the Elohim. None of it's creative. None of it's new. It's like stuff you could get just by watching the sci-fi channel. And yet people were just crazy about it. They were really into it, fully accepting his word as reality. And again, 50 years later, he's still alive. He's living in Japan. Um... You know, he's not living on a pension and he's not punching the clock, okay? Um, yeah. People are still paying his way. And it's it's really disappointing, you know, to see this person fairly easily manipulate thousands and thousands of people and leave nothing but wreckage in his path. Um, as I said, it's only four episodes i really wish there's at least eight maybe 10 or 12 because this is over a course of 50 years there's a lot more that could have been said this for whatever reason the documentary focuses i would say in inordinately on two time periods one is when the realian realian movement is gets in trouble in France over allegations of pedophilia, which a couple of, you know, a small number, a relative handful of Aurelian clergy did go to prison, and they should have gone to prison. They, they were molesting children, and yeah, that happened. The Aurelians uh, managed to rather flip things around and point out that you know, France is a predominantly Catholic country, and we're not the ones with the problem in that area, rather the Catholic Church is. And it was good PR, but, you know, I honestly, I don't believe that realianism is oriented around molesting children. Um, certainly, there's Catholicism, obviously, but anytime you get a sufficient number of people interacting with youth, you're going to get some pedophiles in that mix, whether it's the Boy Scouts or whether it's youth athletics or anything. There's going to be a certain small number of people who are doing terrible things to children. And I think, honestly, in the case of the Realians, they're not about molesting children. The thing is, they're really not about children at all. It's mostly an adult's oriented um, cult. Now, there is a really hard to listen to piece where Morel is on a French talk show and he clearly doesn't know what the hell's going on because when he founded this cult, he, uh, this is the 1970s, it was very much sexual liberation. But by the mid 80s, Things had changed, and 
the things he's saying about children becoming aware of their bodies just comes off so bad. And I, it's hard to watch, to be honest. But I don't feel at any point that that was the focus of the group. Um, but they find they, the, the, it is the focus of the documentary for quite a bit. And, you know, it speaks for itself. The other thing they focus inordinately upon to me is cloning. And there was a debacle, at least it appears to be. There's no 100% certainty on, on the facts presented. But in the very end of the 90s and beginning of the 2000s, um, the Aurelian church um, said that they'd long said that they're going to clone human beings. It's a long, complicated story of why they'd want to do that, but they believe that if you clone human beings, the mind or the soul can move from the old body into the new, younger, duplicate body, which to me is not how cloning would work at all. If you, they, long, I could digress, but I'm not even, it's not worth the time here to say that that when you create a clone, you don't duplicate a human being, you just duplicate their genetics. If we had human cloning, I got cloned today, you don't get a duplicate of me in my 50s. You get an infant that has my genetics, but that's no different than having a twin of different age. You know, I don't see honestly why it's, there was, there was an enormous uproar in the United States and and it prompted President George W. Bush to push for and get a ban on human cloning in the United States. Now, the real debacle occurs when the Raelians said that they had cloned a human person. And it just, there's just an uproar. And they said that a child had been born, who they referred to as Eve, and that she had been, she was a clone of her mother, that this couple was unable to have children. And so they cloned the mother and implanted the embryo in a surrogate and she had been born. And it appears from everything they present in the docuseries that that never happened, that nothing close to that ever happened. That human cloning is certainly a ways off if ever, and it doesn't seem that difficult, honestly, after they created Dolly the Sheep, but Dolly the Sheep had a lot of physical problems too. And, you know, again, it just seemed underwhelming how big a deal that would be. It just, okay. I mean, suppose they did that. I mean, outside of the cult's interests, I mean, it just, that kind of didn't really grab my attention the way that perhaps the you know, director and producers hope to. What you don't get enough of, as far as I'm concerned, is the stories of people who had been in the cult and then gotten out. And you get some of that. And man, it really wrecks some people's lives. And just the general weirdness of being involved with this. The, you know, the mandatory public nudity, the getting a mirror to look up your own anus. I mean, it was just ridiculous and disturbing. And also they'd like a lot of money, okay? And like to use up a lot of your time selling books door to door and things like that, like every other cult has. So yeah, but it, it was absolutely fascinating story. And well worth seeing, uh, take the warnings into account, but well worth absolutely for you know mature audience, it's, it's very good. Very good material there. And a real explanation of why there shouldn't be a stigma to having been in a cult. It's hard enough to leave. And for those that are able to leave, it uh, they should be welcomed by mainstream society rather than 
looked upon as having something wrong with them for having been in a cult. It was a really good example of how literally anyone, under the right circumstances, at the right point in their life, approached in the right manner, can end up in a cult. And that that is a, a good warning and lesson to all of us. So yes, um, fascinating story. Just wish there's more of it in more detail, you know. Um, so yes, what I really got from these two voices, they were very similar. That I felt Dr. Pasolko was laying out the theory of how a UFO cult would come to exist. And there have been, there are numerous UFO cults that are already in existence. Um, she was showing how it could become a major religion in American society and world society. And then the Rael docuseries kind of showed what that would look like in real life. And it's very bad. Towards the end of the series, Raelianism has spread to Africa, throughout Europe, Asia, and the Americas. And do I think it's going to become a major religion? No, not at all. But it did show kind of a blueprint for how something like that would grow exponentially. And it was really, really interesting. And just seeing it take off in places that one might not think. And again, not pushing some you know, exceptionally sophisticated, you know, cunning, deceitful movement, but just dumbly obvious lies, you know, things that didn't even make sense when they were being said, and people were just absorbing that and just couldn't seem to get enough of it. It was, uh, it was sobering in that, that way. So yes, um, by all means, I would suggest, with all the caveats that I said, that anyone listening to this um, would probably get quite a bit out of Rael, the alien prophet. So um, hopefully you found this interesting. We've touched on a couple of interesting topics. Thank you for listening. This has been The Weird Part. I'm Vincent Trewell. Always welcome feedback. Um, thank you for listening and good night.